And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who just loves Bond, James Bond. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, that music makes me happy. I'm going to tell you something that it's great to be back, and I'll tell you why in just a second. But first, that, of course, is the Desmond Llewellyn Orchestra. And the Honor Blackman Dancers, featuring boy tenor Harold Sakata, asking the musical question, Okay, so if I have no lines in this movie, do I still get SAG scale? Well, I hope so, Harold, if that's your real name. Because, folks, all of those wonderful people were, well, in a great James Bond movie. And uh, that would be Goldfinger. And I'm going to tell you more about that later. But Desmond Llewellyn was in all the great James Bond movies. And especially, I think, the first eight or ten with Sean Connery. Oh, I love. And uh, Desmond played Q, one of the great parts, a great character in the uh, James Bond cast there. Because, well, he always came in with things he had just invented to help. James Bond, well, I guess kill all the bad guys. And that's how I put it, by the way. I don't I don't need to say, well, wait a minute, they had lives too. No, they were bad guys, and James Bond killing the bad guys is good enough for me. And in fact, that's a big part of why he's there. And, uh, and Q was always great. Desmond Llewellyn was always great. I love their little sniping at each other. And it was just terrific. I was telling the colonel, I just always loved when he would say, every time, every movie, he would just say, well, you know, Bond, if if you could bring it back working this time, you know, uh, and that's true because, well, James Bond didn't bring things back, did he? In fact, he uh, he just barely brought the, the Honor Blackmans back after he had... Kissed them back to democracy. And uh, yes, I chose the word kissed carefully there. But she, by the way, a great actress and very popular in England. And uh, she was, oh, what a good part. And she was great at it. In Goldfinger again, she played Pussy Galore. And which is, frankly, one of the great names in all of James Bond history. And was credited. I just saw Goldfinger again. There was another James Bond festival weekend. And that's what she's credited as in the beginning. As they're having the, well, you know, the women dance around or swim around uh, naked. We always thought they were naked, too. Even as a kid, you thought, oh, man, they're, like, naked. And uh, it was like seeing what they used to do. They would put them in the shower with the smoky glass on the shower door over the bathtub so that it they looked well. You could see, oh, man, she's naked in there. She's taking a shower, an actual shower, so she's naked. And then, uh, of course, if she half opened the door and, uh, and Sean would toss her a towel. And that's not a euphemism. He would toss her a towel. But at any rate, God bless her, too. She was just great and... Uh, and boy tenor Harold Sakata, who played Odd Job in that movie, and uh, boy, he was terrific in it. That's why the colonel and I gave him that line. Oh, okay, so if I have no lines in this movie, do I still get SAG scale? Which is a level of pay. That's the lowest level of pay in uh, movies. And uh, I think in television, too, SAG, or the Screen Actors Guild, Scale, which is, well, scale, the minimum amount it takes to get you on that set. Well, Harold, first of all, I hope so, because you were great. 
And by the way, he was terrific, but uh, you you just knew he was a bad guy too, which, you know, let's be honest. If you or I ever met Odd Job, we would know he was dangerous without needing to see him fling the hat. You didn't need to see Gert Frobe say, uh, gesture to him on that golf course, you know, okay, prove to Bond how good you are with the hat, and he just flings it a hundred feet away and just slices the head right off that statue. And the statue, of course, was thinking, come on, you couldn't put me by the pool in the back? I have to stand here in the front with a discus just so the chubby over there can throw the hat at me? I know I didn't say chubby. I, I I'm saying you're bubbly. You're very pu- you you're effervescent. You're you're a delight to listen to. But like we would know he was dangerous without needing to see him do that. Because I mean, come on, he was really he was great looking at it. He was, whew. folks. If you see Odd Job, uh, I think it's a good time to remember that early lunch you made. You don't need to go play that round of golf. But uh, he needed nothing. You you don't need guns or poison with odd job. All you need is odd job if he's there. Always in the tuxedo with the bowler hat. He didn't need Q. In odd job, in whatever that organization was, what was it, Smirsh? Or uh, was there an organization? No, it wasn't an organization for that. Not for Goldfinger. It was just Goldfinger. But he didn't need Q or a guy with a job like that of... Uh, to come in and say, all right now, odd job, these are some of the things I've invented for you to help you kill people, uh, you know, this week during the movie. Because odd job could say, even Goldfinger would say, uh, Q, he doesn't, it's odd job for God's sake. He doesn't need, look at the man, he's standing there. And by the way, don't annoy him. That's just my advice. Don't make him mad. But you didn't need all that, you know, and uh, he's the toughest guy in history. By the way, given that he was so tough, uh, the colonel and I were wondering, did he have to be Goldfinger's caddy, too? Is that something else that got thrown in? I mean, 18 holes in the hot sun, carrying the clubs, and, and of course, still wearing the tuxedo and the bowler hat. You had to make him do that. You couldn't just get a guy. It's your golf course, as we find out. Goldfinger owns it. So you know what? You couldn't get another caddy from the back and just have odd job walking around being your bodyguard where every bad guy again has to see him and say, not him, not today, not him. Well, in any case, the Desmond Llewellyn Orchestra and the Honor Blackman Dancers featuring boy tenor Harold Sakata, And they all deserve far more than a tip of the bowler hat from us. But let's give it to him anyway. And by Amazon and PayPal and my book. It's such a pleasure to say these things again. I love that Amazon is a sponsor of ours. They are the only company in the history of the entire earth that does three things that I love. One, they have everything you want, anything you want. They have it. And that's two. Number two, they they already have it. They don't have to order it from someone. They don't have to get it from someone. They don't have to make it. They have it in that gigantic warehouse that's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. They've got everything. And number three, the best part, whatever you order, they send us a percentage of it. And we take that money and we put it right in our tin box with a lock on it. And that's the money, of course, we save for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. Boy, oh boy, those are good dinners. And yes, again, we might, might, might invite Dr. Chris to go along with us. We did for the first one and for the second one, too, right? And uh, he's our old friend from uh, being well and associated, the, uh, not just the sound man, but another co-producer here on our show. And we like him very much. And, of course, he's studying clog dancing at the University of Solvang. And if he's free, we may, may, might, may, might invite him again. 
But boy, oh boy, that Amazon, if you want, if you want to get to them, you could go there on any device you have, anything, yo, your cell phone, your computer, anything, but don't do that. That's a waste. That's a waste of your time and energy. What you do is go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> I like how you shortened it there. It's just, it's more delicate. I'm not sure the word delicate has been used as an adjective to describe that sound, but it is by me. Da 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 da. And his father. You have the two of them there. <laughs> anyway, so go to us. We have a banner that says Amazon right on it. You click our banner and then go take a deep nap. Go lay yourself down in your easy boy chair or your lazy boy chair and take a nap. Put a put a big magazine over your face and, and hit it. And we'll get you there. Amazon and PayPal, another just a terrific group. PayPal, boy, you feel like you're saving the world and all the people in it when you work with PayPal. And who knows, maybe you are. If you enjoy the show, by the way, the Larry Miller Show, and why wouldn't you? Yeah, and, and if you'd like to send us a few bucks to help out, and why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. And by the way, instead of saying donate or pay what you like, or join the Platinum Committee. I, you know, I, I, I'm not fond of any of those categories. I always like to say, buy us some drinks. That's all you have to do, because there are different levels. Levels one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> Boy, that audience is, is always happy. And I'm glad they are. There's nothing like happiness for comedy in the world, folks. There are great blessings all over our lives. But, boy, a good a good theater and a good comic and a good audience. And you always have two of those when you hire me. I don't know which two, by the way, but I know there are two of them. In any case, you know what? They are on our website, too. That's right. There is a PayPal banner on our website when you go to LarryMillerPodcast.com. Oh, I think I forgot to say the next part. I was wondering, where's the big effect? <laughs> LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Boy, that guy just sh should have checked the tuning on that before we went to record. Well, I'm in, you know, I'm in such a good mood though. I'm not going to I'm not going to take him to the volcano and toss him right in. Wait a minute. Well, maybe All right, I'm probably not. Let's just say I'm probably not, okay? And uh maybe I know he just Oh, the poor guy, he just fainted dead away. He's been to the volcano and He's seen me toss some other folks. I don't know why I'm whispering. He's out cold. But in any case, it's a great sound effect. And thank you in advance, because you know what, folks? Every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who has contributed already. It means the world to us. And thank you to those of you who are going to do it now. And by me. That's right. Signed Hardcover copies of my book, Spoiled Rotten America, are now for sale at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. That's right. And uh, it's a good book. I'm very proud of it. It did great in sales, and I'm very proud. It's a funny book, and it's a look. Every chapter is a different look at my view of life. And... Uh, that's so in effect, when you read the book, you could be like one of the folks in that audience going, yes, because uh, I know I am too. In any case, uh, do that. Go to store.comedyfilmnerds.com. It means a lot. And, you know, I just want to say it is a real pleasure to be back here now because we were off for three weeks. 
And there are good reasons for that. Colonel Jeff got the flu three weeks ago, and he got the no kidding around flu. He got the, this, this wasn't made up. He was walloped, and he needed some time to lie there walloped. You, we, we all forget that, but sometimes you can get what he got, which is the real deal flu. And it took him a full two weeks just to get his sea legs back again and uh, so they weren't all wobbly. And uh, God bless him, he uh, he recovered completely. And uh, he then, after that, he had a week off. That was a week for his vacation that he was already set down for. And he did that. He went to visit one of his old friends and stay with him. And he took a, a place in a really nice hotel down by back on the mainland in Southern California, near San Diego, in fact, in San Diego. And uh, it really worked for him. You know, folks, this sounded good to me, and I hope it will to you too, that he said, because I, uh, you know, I made him a cup of coffee, as I always do, when, uh, when well, well, he comes so we can do our show. But, you know, he's talking about how when he was on that vacation week, and it was after the two weeks of the flu, and on that vacation week, in the fancy hotel, and he said, you know what? He he got some tea bags, too, that he wanted to bring back to the hotel room because he said, you know what? It's enough already with coffee. It's enough already with coffee with the, with the little containers that you put in there and the automatic pots that begin to get annoying after a while. He said uh, he, he felt when I wake up in the morning on this vacation, on this seven days, he said, I might be too tired and I might be just too out of it to want to make coffee in the room or even order the coffee for breakfast, for room service. Well, just just a tea bag and some hot water is fine for me. And that, that sounded good. I said, you know what? I'll tell you something, buddy. I, I, I agree with you on that one. There's nothing like something easier when you finally have the chance to take a little time off. It doesn't happen for you or for me or for Colonel Jeff very often at all, folks. But he needed it, and he got it. And when I said, how do you feel now <laughs> when he came by to record today, he said, you know what? I feel just like I could use another three weeks off. And uh, I said, I hear you. I understand. So welcome back to him, and welcome back to you folks, and welcome back to me. It uh, means a lot to be back in business and putting out a new show. And let's continue with it. Here it is. To my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. And uh, who doesn't like a little bongo drum like that? It sounds like a character in a, in a Hanna-Barbera cartoon trying to escape but having his legs beat the air just long enough for that bongo drum effect. And uh, this is a good joke. Both, both the colonel and I like this one. Uh, there's a fella who is an explorer, and he is in his, uh, his two-person airplane, his private airplane that he owns, and he's flying across the Amazon in, well, in South America there. Oh, and it's a hot day. It's the hot season and boy, oh boy, everything is dripping with hot. And uh, sure enough, wouldn't you know it, out of nowhere, the engine seizes. It gets in, in trouble. The engine, just pa, 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 and he starts sinking and spinning as he's going down. Folks, that plane goes down, and he just brings it together. He's such a good explorer that he brings it together to land it. It's a crash landing on one of the sides of the Amazon there, of course, but he gets it to where, you know what, folks? He's not dead. He saved his own life. That plane is, well, that plane is finished. It is all cracked up, and that plane won't be used again, but he gets out of it, and he stretches, he examines himself, and he, he says, fine. Oh, unbelievable. I, I, I'm okay. And he stretches a little bit, and he just takes a step or two away from it, and that's 
That's when he looks around him and sees he's surrounded by a tribe of fierce head-hunting cannibals. And they are just staring at him with that fierce look they have. And they are all armed with their spears. And he, he just can't, he's so stunned by all of them in a circle around him that he, he just mutters, he says out loud, Oh, I am so screwed right now. And suddenly God's voice comes out of heaven and says to him, don't say that. You are not screwed. Now listen to me carefully. Go turn to the nearest warrior and push him and grab the spear right out of his hands. Go do it now. And then as soon as that happens, run, run across the opening right to the chief and stick it right into the chief, right into his center, right into his heart. Go, do this now. And uh, and so the guy, well, it's God telling me to do this. He does, he grabs, he grabs the spear out of the nearest warrior, knocks him down with his shoulder and then takes it, sees the, the chief, runs across the circle right at the chief and sticks it completely into him and through him and stabs him right in his heart. And the chief falls dead, bleeding all over the jungle. And then God's voice comes back and says, Okay, now you're screwed. (laughs) We both got a kick out of that joke. Now, now I'm screwed? That's, you're, you saved me? You're God? And then you just did that to, to, to mess with me? Because of my use of words? What? 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 And sure enough, we thought, yeah, now you're screwed. I mean, that's, you're all alone in the middle of the tribe that on a good day was going to cook you and eat you. Now that you've, well, killed one of their warriors and the chief. Well, I bet they've got something terrific planned for you now. (laughs) But yes, now you're screwed. In any case, I hope you like that. It uh, made us laugh here. God saying, okay, now you're screwed. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show. The Poetry Corner. That's lovely. As beautiful as that string quartet plays, by the way, I think they they would have been a little screwed, too, if they had landed on that side of the Amazon. They couldn't say to the to the tribal Indians there, just for the record, we're a really good quartet. We could uh, play that for you now, do something nice, a classic or something we've written. I'm not sure they would get to the end of that sentence because those guys would just have learned to say in English, no, now you screwed. So uh, in any case, uh, this is a wonderful poem by the great Oliver Wendell Holmes. And I know you're thinking, wait a minute, you mean Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great American lawyer, judge, and Supreme Court justice? Born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and and, uh, based in Boston. He lived from 1809 to 1894. Yes, it is. But like so many other great minds of his day, he was a poet, too. And this one is called The Boys by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Has there any old fellow got mixed with the boys? If there has, take him out without making a noise. Hang the almanacs cheat and the catalogs spite. Old time is a liar. We're twenty tonight. We're twenty. We're twenty. Who says we are more? He's tipsy, young jack and apes. Show him the door. Gray temples at twenty. Yes. White, if we please. 
Where the snowflakes fall thickest, there's nothing can freeze. Was it snowing I spoke of? Excuse the mistake. Look close, you will see not a sign of a flake. We want some new garlands for those we have shed, and these are white roses in place of the red. We've a trick, we young fellows. You may have been told of talking in public as if we were old. That boy we call doctor, and this we call judge. It's a neat little fiction, of course, it's all fudge. That fellow's the speaker, the one on the right. Mr. Mayor, my young one, how are you tonight? That's our member of Congress, we say when we chaff. There's the reverend. What's his name? Don't make me laugh. That boy with the grave mathematical look made believe he had written a wonderful book and the Royal Society thought it was true. So they chose him right in. A good joke it was, too. There's a boy we pretend with a three-decker brain that could harness a team with a logical chain. When he spoke for our manhood in syllabled fire, we called him the justice, but now he's the squire. And there's a nice youngster of excellent pith. Fate tried to conceal him by naming him Smith, but he shouted a song for the brave and the free. Just read on his medal, my country of thee. You hear that boy laughing? You think he's all fun? But the angels laugh, too, at the good he has done. The children laugh loud as they troop to his call, and the poor man that knows him laughs loudest of all. Yes, we're boys, always playing with tongue or with pen, and I sometimes have asked, Shall we ever be men? Shall we always be youthful and laughing and gay till the last dear companion drops smiling away? Then here's to our boyhood. It's gold and it's gray, the stars of its winter, the dews of its May. And when we have done with our life-lasting toys, dear father, take care of thy children. The boys! Well, isn't that nice, folks? Good work from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And it does mean a lot, boy, that uh, someone that brilliant, someone that much in charge of the way our country moved and lived and grew, could well write a poem that moved us too. I think I ought to stop rhyming. <laughs> no, but now that the poem's over. But that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. M M M Triple M Magic Movie Moment. Well, folks, there was a reason I mentioned Desmond Llewellyn and Honor Blackman and Harold Sakata because I wanted to talk about Goldfinger this week. From 1964, a great James Bond movie starring Sean Connery, well, Honor Blackman, Gert Frobe as Goldfinger, directed by Guy Hamilton, written by Richard Malbum and Paul Dane, and Ian Fleming, that's right, even though he wasn't credited in that one, well, it's Ian Fleming. He wrote all the books, all the James Bond books, and they're great books, by the way. Try them out if you never have. All of Ian Fleming's work as 007. Wow. But Goldfinger is one of them. And, and folks, it means so much. I love Sean Connery. Yes, I do. And I I, I really care for all the other James Bond I, uh, characters. I, I love them, too. And... Uh, that uh, that means you know I've come around on 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 several. I mean, uh, Roger Moore is way better than you you, uh, you may think, or that I used to think. And I thought, how do you like that, Roger Moore? I loved him as the Saint, and he's a terrific James Bond, and he is. And Pierce Brosnan, and uh, good Lord Daniel Craig too. 
And by the way, they're wonderful actors, and that is just as true as it could be. But, yes, I'm sorry. There's no one like Sean Connery, period. And that's just the way it is. And among many, many other things, <laughs> I wanted to talk about the little lines he throws away after he dispatches one of the bad guys. In other words, kills him. <laughs> he, in the beginning of Goldfinger, well, he goes back after he's really just wiped out a whole section of bad guys and uh, one of the clerks there at the hotel where he just does that. It just says to him, uh, well, Mr. Bond, the car's here for the airport. The flight's in an hour. And uh, and uh, yeah, I think you better get on that plane so you make sure you make it. And Bond says, Sean Connery says, I just have one more thing I have to take care of. And the guy says to him, you know, warns him and says, well, sir, I I hope you do it quickly because uh, you've created quite a ruckus here. And uh, I think getting out of town is the best idea for you. And uh, he goes back to, well, a little apartment where there's a, yes, a beautiful woman in the tub. She's just gotten out and she's been waiting for him. By the way, you don't even have to know this. I don't even know how this, you know, no one knows it, but of course she's waiting for him there. You know, what, what gorgeous woman in any port of call is not waiting for James Bond? But uh, she she does that. She comes out and she's wrapped a towel around herself. And she and James say that, uh, and I think that's the one where also where his gun bumps her a little, the gun and the shoulder host, shoulder holster just bumps into her a little. And uh, she says, oh boy. And he, he takes it out and puts it down. And uh, that's when they they have a, a nice kiss. And we notice something. The second they do that, suddenly her eyes open. So she's looking at him as they're kissing. And he opens his because his, his instincts are great. This is James Bond. And he looks in her eyes and he sees, reflected in her eyes, he sees a guy sneaking into the apartment. And that's, well, that's not good news for anyone. And he does that, and sure enough, uh, that she's part of this, of the bad guys, and he just pushes her aside, tosses her away, and she whacks her head on one of the cabinets sitting there, and he gets into a fight with this guy. And uh, as James Bond can do and should do and does, he beats the guy, but the guy gets in a couple of good shots, but then James Bond, you know, just flips him, tosses him into the bathtub that's still full of water there. And the guy, oh, sloshes around for just a second. And the guy sees James Bond's gun hanging in its shoulder holster where he put it. And he reaches for the gun. Now, does Sean Connery panic? Of course not. What he does is he looks and he's standing next to a cabinet in the bathroom there on which is a radio, and the radio is on, playing music. And he just, he doesn't pick it up and toss it. It's so, it's cool. It's perfect for Sean Connery. He knocks it. He slaps it. It goes right across the bathroom into the bathtub where the guy still is. And folks, there's a flash and a, and a boom, uh, the, you know, fully electrical. It just fries the guy. And he's gone. That's over. And Bond now takes his own gun for, and puts it back on and snaps it in place, looks at the guy in the bathtub and just says, shocking. And no one can say that like Sean Connery. Because what I always loved about his little asides and the ones that were very witty, like, for goodness sake, you know, he just fried the guy by slapping in a radio that was on right into the bathtub. You know, 10 feet away, goes right in, go, boy, it lights that place up and kills the guy. And then he just says, shocking, to whom? That's what I love. He's not boasting. He's not performing for anyone, least of all the audience. He's saying it for himself. He's He loves doing that. For himself, 
making a little witty comment. Shocking. And then the young woman, who was one of the bad guys, who was in the bathtub, is now on the floor with the towel around her, and she's the one who walloped her head, and she kind of moans and... uh, She's coming to a little bit. Now he looks at her and says, positively shocking. So those are the two lines. Shocking, and then positively shocking. But they're not fast. They're said with such rhythm and grace and such smoothness. And he does that. He puts that gun on. He picks up his suit jacket again, puts that on, and just strolls like a panther out of that room. And boy, oh boy, that's what, Goldfinger's a great movie anyway, folks. But I just wanted very much to light up for you and for myself and for Colonel Jeff, who agrees with this, by the way, that every time Sean Connery, in addition to how great he was and everything else as James Bond, in addition to that, though, whenever he says something witty, he says it just right. He does it in a way that, as much as I like the other fellas, they can't do. They can't do it. And as much as he says his name, he says it so well. Bond, James Bond. And I'm not not even trying to imitate him because he's so good at it. The the others can't do it. And uh, so that's another reason I love Sean Connery. But boy, folks, Goldfinger from 1964 has so much in it. If you haven't seen it, see it. You're going to love it. And if you have seen it 30 times, like me, see it again. The next time there's a James Bond festival on one of those weekends, see Gold, see them all, but make sure you see Goldfinger. And I think you'll find it thrilling, romantic, uh, funny. Oh, it's it's everything good and dramatic. And I think you also might find it shocking, positively shocking. And, you know, there's there's nothing better than knowing that. Good Lord, Ian Fleming made something so good. And it reminded me of something, of, of all the James Bond movies. And I, 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 I never understood this. And I still love them today. I adore it today. When Sean Connery checks into the greatest hotels in the world, in Paris, in Rome, in the Bahamas, you know, anywhere in the world, the uh, the clerk always says as he walks in, Ah, oh, Mr. Bond, good to see you. And he hasn't been there in 11 years. But they, they all know him. They all adore him. And because he saved their lives, their whole community the last time, and he's back now, they love him. And the guy always says, We have your room ready for you. He hasn't been there in 11 years, but they have the room ready. They've never given that room to anyone. And it's still the, the the James Bond suite. They might as well put a plaque on it. The James Bond suite. And he has uh, one of the uh, young ladies from behind the desk there, one of the clerks, take him up to the room there. And, well, that's that's terrific, too, because she's beautiful. Well, how could she not be beautiful? And she sees, for goodness sake, she sees Sean Connery walk in that hotel. She wasn't even born yet the last time he was there. But you know what, though? He was... She wants to see, oh, look at that, it's James Bond. She's in love with him already. And she walks him into the room. But what always made me smile still does everything I, every time I see a movie like this, she takes him into the room there and shows him there's one bedroom, there's another bedroom, here's one, they have three bathrooms, That's everything is covered in pearls and gold. It's just a fabulous room and uh, and so well decorated. But I oh, I always notice, no TV. There's never a TV in that room. Now, in the case of Goldfinger, it was 1964. There were TVs all over the place then. Were there still a couple of folks here and there across America, let's say, who didn't have TVs? Well, sure. Why not people do, do what they like? When I was a, a new comic, I didn't have a TV in every apartment I was in. I had an apartment in New York and 
than my first apartment here in Los Angeles when I moved. No TVs. I didn't need a TV. I, I, I didn't want a TV. I like TV as much as you do, much as anyone does. But I didn't want one. I didn't need it. And when, uh, when I would say have a, a woman in the apartment, which happened more than you might think. And, uh, but when I, I did, she would always say something like, you don't have a TV? Because also, for crying out loud, I'm a comedian and an actor and a writer. I've written many things that were on. And plus, after you did The Tonight Show, when you were on in the, you know, when you first got on with Johnny Carson, these were very big things. Well, I would watch the show. You you might think, didn't you want to see yourself on The Tonight Show? Or with Jay or The Letterman Show? Didn't you want to to do that? And the answer was, well, I, I would watch it at the Improv then. I'd go over to the Improv on Melrose, be there with my friends. And, well, they all knew I was on that night. So I was there. The show was at 1130 at night, as you know. And, well, I'd I'd watch it there. And that was neat, just to see yourself on TV and uh, stand next to a f- several young women just to say, hey, look at that. It's me <laughs> on, t- on TV. But you know what? I I just can't believe no TV in those first class around the world suites for James Bond. And that was just a style, I guess, of how even the best hotels were built. No TV. And today, I was saying to Colonel Jeff before, and he knew this, and you knew it. You know this too. If you go to uh, any hotel or motel anywhere in America. It could be, uh, you know, the lowest or the highest. It doesn't matter. They TV, they have four TVs. And that's just for a regular, say, like a, a motel six room. And, and nothing against them. They're good motels. But they have which, whichever wall you turn to. Hey, look, it's another giant screen of a TV. They have one even in, in the bathrooms. Hey, look, a TV in the bathroom. So you don't have to miss one second of TV when you might have to pee. But it always interests me that, boy, oh boy, not for James Bond. And I started to think about, well, the things that we have that we don't have anymore, that, for instance, making coffee with percolators. I was talking to the colonel about that. We have one of those drip things that come out of the little plastic cups that everyone has. You've seen them. Heck, you probably have one too. And you put it in there and the water drips through it. And, you know, that's good. And the colonel and I just had a cup each as we got started today, as we always do. But you know what? I miss percolators. I miss, I don't even mean the ones you plug in that you used to uh, bubble and pop top through the, through the glass there. I mean a percolator, the ones that don't even have to be a big pot. Well, they're only about six or eight ounces. But you put it in there and you fill that little tub that goes in it with coffee. And you put it in there once the water's in. But you put that cap on and put it on the stove. You have to know how to make a cup of coffee to do that, to use it. And it's not easy. It may not be the hardest thing in the world. But you know what? If you don't make it well, it tastes like the hardest thing in the world. And I mean, you have to just put the heat on just enough to get it bubbling, to get it percolating. And you start to see that first blit, blit it where it comes into the little glass top, into the little glass knob on top. And that's how you watch it. You then have to, well, lower the heat a little bit so that it, it percolates regularly, that it goes bubble, bubble. Or as the colonel reminded me, wasn't it, was it Folgers who used to have that television ad of that da 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 and the, it, to the percolating as it, and I thought, even as a kid, boy, that looks great. I like that. And I had a girlfriend when I was in New York in my early days as a comic and, oh boy, she was wonderful, uh, Patty. And, and she, you know what, she was a, uh, lived a very glamorous life. She was a model and she was on the cover. Her her picture 
was on the cover of every romance book that you've ever seen. Those are the paperback books and uh, where the big, strong, tough guy is holding her up. It was, it was set in 1870, whenever it was, but that was always her picture. And you know what, though? She loved making her own coffee. She liked making it in one of those little percolators. And I loved seeing her do that. Well, I guess I loved everything. But but the cherry on top, so to speak, was watching her percolate some coffee. And you know what? One of these days, and I did, I, I, I said to the colonel before, you know what? Do they even still have percolators? I'd be sad if they didn't. I mean... Because that's kind of a big uh, offense. On Milleronia, that's a very quick trip to the volcano. If you go to the coffee shop or the place where they have, well, breakfast ware and, uh, and forks and knives and, and mats and plates and pillows and all sorts of things, if they don't have percolators, well, that fellow's going to be percolating himself in just a minute later. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick him up like a cat by the scruff of the neck and walk him right up to the volcano. Coffee percolators. Do they still have them? If they do, if you know of one, for interest, please send a note on to the website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> Good one, Colonel Jeff. I think that was probably a little surprise, that one. He's got a board of, you know, he's in, he controls everything, and he's very good at it. But you know what? Please send us a note if you know of, of a place that has coffee percolators. And I know you know the ones I mean. I remember an old Fred Allen radio show where they're looking for the guy who wound up playing Fred Flintstone on the cartoons when the Flintstones became such a big hit. And you'd know his voice in a second. He was in the cast of characters on the Fred Allen show. And he was playing, whoa, one week they lost. There was a big diamond stolen. And it was a big drama. And well, it was the Fred Allen show. It was a good comedy too. But this guy turns out to be the bad guy. Oh, yeah. The uh, the Fred Flintstone guy. And, uh, and Fred Allen tracks him down finally and says, all right, you've had it. And uh, give up that stolen diamond. And... Fred Flintstone guy says, "What a diamond? It's not a diamond. That's the top to my percolator. I am a coffee fanatic. I drink twenty cups a day, and I lost that. Someone made off with it, and so you know what? Yes, I want it back, but it's not a diamond. It's a little glass percolator top. And even as a kid, I remember when my friend and I joined the old radio show club." I remember thinking, wow, that's actually pretty neat. I didn't think that was a silly plot point. I thought, that's brilliant. They go all around the world to solve the great stolen diamond case, and it turns out to be, no, it's just the top to this guy's coffee maker. But you know what? Please uh, please let me know if you know of a coffee percolator. I, I, and I started wondering, do... Do we even have commercials for coffee anymore? I don't think so. I mean, don't people still have brand loyalty? I think they should. That, uh, you know, folks, good to the last drop, which is the, well, I would hope famous Maxwell House slogan. I think it's the great, uh, I think it may be the greatest slogan in the history of products. Good to the last drop, in quotes on the front of that great blue can. You know, that's from Teddy Roosevelt. And that's a no-kidding moment from President Teddy Roosevelt. And right in the middle, around 1906, he was on one of his uh, trips around the country that he took a lot of. And it wasn't just to kill a hundred or so animals, <laughs> which he loved doing that. He was a big hunter. He was a big adventurer. And you know what? They stopped at the... Maxwell House Restaurant, and I think it was in South Dakota. I'm not sure, though, but this is absolutely true. It's factual that President Teddy Roosevelt is in there. He and uh, his, well, his co-adventurers there, and I guess a Secret Service guy or two standing in back of them, they uh, they had a great lunch there, and they 
good good cups of coffee and Teddy Roosevelt on uh, at the end of the meal there as he you know finishes his cup of coffee there he said you know something that coffee is good to the last drop and he just said that out loud and you as you may imagine well think of it in 1906 the wait staff the waiter everybody there went nuts it didn't matter it was in the middle of south dakota it didn't matter where it was they went nuts president roosevelt just said our coffee is good to the last drop and they immediately contacted telegram well maybe they just called the head offices of maxwell house and went right to the president of the company just to say sir president roosevelt just said our coffee was good to the last drop and they went nuts the president everyone said that's the greatest slogan ever and it's been on the can ever since and it should be and if you if you don't know where that came from well i'm i'm glad you know it now and i was wondering well shouldn't maxwell house do something with that today speaking of commercials for coffee i mean that slogan good to the last drop was actually said and was actually said by president teddy roosevelt i mean for crying out loud that's pretty big and I mentioned Folgers had the percolator pop and the bubble rhythmically. Doesn't anyone still do that? I'd like it if they did. I, I miss coffee ads. I miss the ones where, uh, you know, he would say, uh, I just remembered one, <laughs> uh, that they're at uh, the married couple is at their friend's place for dinner. It looks like a house. I don't think that's an apartment. But they have uh, the guy's wife uh, that, that's, that, that they're visiting just says to the guy, uh, more coffee, Bob, or, you know, whatever his name was, Bob, Bill or something, you know. And he and uh, he the wife, of course, has that look on her face that, no, he won't have one. And he immediately holds his cup up and says, yes, please. Thank you. This is terrific coffee. And she pours him another one from this brand. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was Uban or something like that, but it was, uh, it was, he really likes it. And then his wife says in her imagination, she looks at him, hmm, he never has a second cup at home. And it's a very good married moment from 1961 or whatever the heck that was. But, and now she's going to make it at home before or after he wraps her in saran wrap. But, we have a lot of things that don't happen anymore and things I miss. And next week, well, we have plenty more to do, and plenty more to give you. And uh, boy, I sure do miss those James Bond movies with Sean Connery. And I'm glad they have the festivals on. I'm glad he's always offered a drink to start a meeting. Everyone drank. Can I get you a drink? Well, sure. You know, and... And the rooms didn't have TVs, but I guess those suites they gave him needed more room for the beautiful desk clerks and the tarantulas she left behind as she left because, of course, that's her main job was to wait 11 years to kill him. But you know what? I'm sure glad those movies give me things to look at now. And I hope you feel that way, too. I know that. And you know it, too. And we both know... Well, Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a house to come back to, and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Be well, and it's good to be back. We'll see you here next week. <laughs>